ahead and do this. Um, welcome, Kevin. We're so glad and thankful that you're going to share your knowledge and expertise with us this evening. Thank you very much, Bronwyn. And, and um, let's just see if I can remember how to share my screen that we just did 10 minutes ago. So I can't be unable to multitask. Give me just a second while we we mess with that. And Bronwyn, I'm going to count on you to tell me if I've got it right. You can see my screen, correct? I can see your screen. Okay, well, that's the start of it. And now let's see if we can do this. And let's do that. So still got the whole screen showing, correct? That is correct. All right, cool. Okay, so hello, everybody. My name is Kevin Dodge. And as Bronwyn said, I teach at Garrett College. I've been here since 1987. And I oversee a program called Natural Resources and Wildlife Technology. It's a mouthful of a program, so we abbreviate it NRWT, which is still a mouthful. But the point of our program is um, to take students, whether they're hoping to go get a job after they graduate or transfer on to a four-year school and to give them the kind of practical field-based background that's going to really give them a step up on um, other people in terms of um, uh, successfulness or success in a four-year school and um, employability in the in the work world. So our students go on to work in all fields of natural resources and wildlife and fisheries and forestry and soil conservation, wetlands and parks and uh, uh, many, many other things, um, whether they work for a, a government agency, the private sector, or a nonprofit. So that's what I do, but that's not what you want to hear about tonight. Um, hopefully you're here to learn a little bit about the Northern Saw Wet Owl, and uh, you've come hopefully to the right place. So let's go ahead and, and get started. <clears throat> so um, I'm sure many of you all are familiar with the, you know, the kind of the common typical owls, and some of y'all have mentioned these uh, in the chat as we got started. There's the great horned owl, this big beefy owl of uh, fields and forest edges. It's pretty common. It's the one that does the <clears throat> So that's the great horned owl. There's the barred owl, a, a, a pretty common across Maryland forest owl that does the <laughs> Um, sometimes, just like last night, as I walked along the, the dark road, all I heard was like that. So that's the barred owl. And many of y'all are familiar with the much smaller eastern screech owl, which uh, when you go to the drop down menu, you can order in red or gray. It's not actually true, but um, you can see both red and gray phases. These are common in a variety of fairly open edge habits or habitats. As long as you've got some trees with cavities in them, you can have eastern screech owls and they do a couple of sounds. They go. And so that's the Eastern Screech Owl. Um, you may be familiar with the barn owl, this crazy heart-faced owl, really wide underneath that may be the source of a lot of uh, haunted house legends. It does a crazy amount of different screeching and, and um, hissing. I actually was very fortunate, just saw one fly into an, a silo on my way home a couple, three nights ago, on my uh, right very close to where I live. So we've got them nesting up here. And you may even be familiar with the snowy owl, which occasionally will show up in very open, windswept habitats here in Maryland during the winter. <clears throat> but you may not have been aware that this little guy, the northern sawwet owl, is also an owl that occurs in Maryland. Now, many of you all know, you know, are familiar with the story that we heard about last Christmas of the sawwet owl that um, was found in a tree that had been cut down in upstate New York and brought to Rockefeller Center. And there was an owl in the middle of it. And of course, they then ultimately uh, were able to release it back where um, it had come from. 
And actually, this isn't the first time something like this has happened. This may have even happened in New York back in 2018. If I'm not um, mistaken, there was once a sawed owl that ended up in a tree in the Natural Wild or National Wildlife Visitor Center down at Patuxent one time. So this this happens with some frequency. So that's the northern sawed owl, but it is a cool little owl. It is the tiniest owl that we have in the eastern United States, so therefore the tiniest owl we have in Maryland. Some of you all may remember the license plates that you could see in Pennsylvania um, that uh, the state sold to raise funds for the Wild Resources Conservation Fund quite some time ago, and that was intended to be a northern sawed owl. But it's a tiny little guy um, that um, is difficult to find, surprisingly secretive. Um, people don't tend to hear it very often. And so folks don't know a whole lot about it. Um, they eat small mammals, mice and shrews and voles. They will eat um, small birds. They will um, even eat insects. And here is the range map for the northern sawwet owl. And if you look at this range map, you will see where you see the pink. This is where they occur as a permanent resident. That means you could find them there any time of year. They nest in that region and they also can occur there in the winter. You can see that the range extends down through the various mountain masses in the west. They get into the Great Lakes states, northern Pennsylvania, New England. And we got these little areas down here that we're going to talk about a little later. But in general, when you get to Maryland, it shows them as a non-breeding resident, which they really mean as something that you can find in the winter. And that is true. If you are really lucky, you may find one during the winter roosting very, um, very quietly in some thick evergreen foliage. You can even go to those stunted loblolly pines just in from the beach on Assateague. And if you know what you're doing, sometimes you can find these guys. You can find them in tangles of Japanese honeysuckle. You can find them in Eastern red cedars, but they're pretty difficult to find. But the question that people have often had, most people just thought they occasionally showed up in the winter. Nobody really knew anything about them at other times of the year and really kind of questioned that they would ever occur in Maryland at other times of the year. Um, so that brings me to this guy right here. This is Dave Brinker, um, a friend of mine who um, came to Maryland from Wisconsin in the 80s to, um, to, to, for graduate school at uh, the University of Maryland's Environmental Research Lab in Frostburg called the Appalachian Lab. And I actually met Dave when he was a student. Dave went on to start work later in the 80s for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources Wildlife and Heritage Program, initially on colonial water birds down on the, uh, the coast. And then later on as, as in his current position as a central region uh, ecologist for the Wildlife and Heritage Program. This is him in the, um, in the early 90s working with me. Um, he looks even more distinguished now, and you may have seen him on Outdoors Maryland, and now he's involved with um, uh, the big snowy owl research project that's gotten a lot of attention. And I should also mention this, this Dave Brinker, you know, people that think that folks that can chase around and find a lot of birds and add them to their life list and, and all that, that those are the really the rock stars. Dave is actually a true rock star. Um, just a few days ago, uh, a program came on uh, about um, Dave's efforts to try to, um, to, to do something to provide nesting substrate for some of our uh, beach nesting birds. And if you just Google um, turn Maryland um, coastal bay or something like that you will find this video that just came out i think four days ago so i encourage you to check that out so anyhow dave being from wisconsin had learned to catch sawwood owls during fall and migration um because people in wisconsin had been doing this since 1950 
he knew that uh, folks at Cape May, who do a lot of different kind of migration research, had been netting a few sawwets in the fall since 1980. So he got this crazy idea, and I'm telling you, people thought he was nuts, to try to net them at Finzel Swamp, which is a nature conservancy preserve in the northeastern uh, corner of Garrett County. And he did this while he was in grad school and then had students from Frostburg State and the Appalachian do that after he left. And that station ran through 1990. Dave established another station uh, at Assateague Island, which is now the second longest running Sawet uh, fall migration study in the eastern U.S. He did that in 91, and he convinced me, foolish person that I was, to begin doing this in 1992. So we've been at it here at Garrett College uh, with help from a lot of students as well from Frostburg State since 1992. So in Maryland, we have an, a number of different stations and this doesn't really even show them all. So here we are out in Garrett County. Uh, a friend of mine, Steve Huey, has one up on Lambs Knoll, up on South Mountain. Um, there are some on the shore at Tuckahoe, Foreman's Branch, um, Assateague, here's Dave Station. And there, there has been one, um, there, there have been several in Central Maryland as well that are not on this map. And this is part of a network of stations all across North America. And this is actually a dated map, but you can see there are people from Canada all the way down to Alabama now and Georgia um, and from uh, like Boston all the way out to Vancouver Island and even up in Homer, Alaska, uh, studying these guys. And they're all part of a network of banders that make up Project Alnet and, and we are a part of that. So starting in 1992, we began to misnet these birds in the fall and document their migration here in far western Maryland. And what you do is you string up mist nets, these very uh, thin, hard to see black nylon mesh nets. We open our nets up at night and we play the call of the northern sawwet owl. Now this looks really fancy, this Fox Pro that we use now, but we started out with a cassette player and a um, answering machine loop uh, cassette to do this. But we, we have found, but researchers have found that playing the call of this bird increases the likelihood of capturing sawwet owls by about a thousand percent. And that has made doing this and staying up all night worth our while now that we have a way of attracting them in. We call it an audio lure. You can see that word audio lure. So we play this call and whenever a bird shows up in the net, it looks scary and it's not. We carefully extract them from the net. We take them back to our station and we put a bird band on them. That's the very first thing that we do. Here's a bird with a band on its leg. And Bird bands, um, as you probably know, uh, each bird band is stamped with a unique number that no other bird will ever get so that if somebody else ever catches that bird again, we will know where it came from. And bird bands are used on birds from the size of eagles and uh, pelicans all the way down, believe it or not, to hummingbirds. People do bands for hummingbirds as well. So we do that, <clears throat> we weigh the birds, we measure, take a couple different types of measurement on their wing. This one is being measured for the wing cord is what it's called. And we use those two pieces of information. And by the way, this chart will be on the test, okay? Um, we use these two pieces of information to determine the sex of the bird because in birds of prey, including owls, females are larger than males. And so we use a combination of length of the wing and the weight of the bird to determine whether we have a male or female. So we determine the sex of the bird. We take a variety of other measurements. We measure the, the longest uh, tail feathers. We measure the colman or the distance from the nostril to the tip of the bill. We actually make a note on what the color of the tip of the bill is. We record the color of the eyes. We, we conveniently use these paint chips to do this. And uh, their, the owls do vary in the color of their eyes. We check the condition in terms of fat. Birds store fat 
under the surface of their skin. And a really easy way to find it is in what you might call the wing pit. We blow the feathers apart and look at this little pocket in there to see how much fat they have stored. This one appears to have just a tiny little bit in the, in the deepest part of that depression. And then we look at the flight feathers, what we call the primaries and the secondaries on the wing. We want to know whether all the feathers are of the same age or whether some feathers are newer and some feathers are older. So flight feathers are like blue jeans. When they're new, they're darker and they're nice and neat and unmarred. As they get older, they begin to fade. Um, and so, you can look at them with the natural color, but somebody figured out that an even better way to assess this is to use black light, you know, clue the Led Zeppelin and the really cool poster and the black light circa 1971, here you go. And the newer feathers fluoresce pink, the older feathers do not. What's the point of this? Well, here's another chart that will be on the test. But the point of this is that if there's only one time in a bird's life, for most birds, when all the feathers on the wing are um, replaced at the same time. And it's really the first time that they're ever, um, they ever come in as a, as a fledgling bird. So in the nest, there is a nestling before they fledge so that they have a completely new set of feathers. Um, after that, birds replace their feathers only a few at a time so that they retain the ability to fly. Now, ducks and geese and swans and some other birds are different and actually go through a flightless period, but that is not the case of owls because it's pretty hard to catch food when you can't fly. So we can look at the feathers. If they're all the same age, we know we have what's called a hatch year bird. It hatched that spring. If, however, some of the feathers are newer and some of the feathers are older, we can look at the specific pattern to determine whether it hatched the previous year, so it's a second year bird, it's in its second full year of life, or some other age, as you can see here and here. So we get this information on these birds. And it's not me that does the majority of the work, it is students. We have had, I couldn't even, I wish I had a count of this, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, maybe a thousand or more students now in, the, in 29 years working on this project. Here's some pictures, obviously, last fall during the pandemic of a Grant Helmstetter from uh, kind of near York or Gettysburg, PA. And here's Maria Metz from Oakland, Maryland, and a guy named Kyle Klotz, all collecting data. So it's students that run this show and have done so all these years. We are, to my knowledge, the only station in North America that is primarily run by college students from Garrett College and Frostburg State. So what have we found? Well, here is a table of data from 92 through this past fall 2020, showing the total number of birds that we've caught each year. And one thing that you will notice, it's, it's quite variable. Um, we have these, we used to have these big peaks roughly every four years here, for instance, here, you had this big peak just two years later. And, and this, this trend continued for some time where every other year you had more birds um, than the previous year. So that on the odd number of years, it started out, but roughly every four years, you got a big peak and that appears to correspond with a big peak in the number of voles up in the northern forest where these guys breed. If you have, it actually goes back to the cone crop of the conifers, the evergreen trees that produce cones. If you have a big cone crop in the fall, that means you, you are able to um, support a large population of small rodents on the forest floor, which means the following spring, the females, when they're nesting, are in good shape. They produce a lot of young. The young have a high rate of survival. And then all those young come pouring out of the northern forest southward, and we catch some of them. 
West Nile virus appears to have thrown this off to some extent in the 2000s. So our numbers look a little bit different. Um, our numbers are down, but we also had to change to a new location that may have affected slightly our captures. You can see though, we still have roughly every four years, a peak in numbers. So in 29 years, we've caught over 3,500 owls with an average of over 120 every year. We catch owls that have been banded all over the place so to our north, both in the US and Canada, um, or people catch the owls that we have banded previously in a number of different places. And as more people have gotten into this, as more people are finding how helpful that audio lure is to attracting birds, we're getting more and more of what we call foreign retraps, or more and more people are catching the birds that we have banded. We've also exchanged birds with other stations in Maryland from one year to the next. So this isn't necessarily, for instance, this is a uh, Hawk Ridge in Duluth, Minnesota. This isn't necessarily a bird that was banded here and we caught it the same year. It could be in a different year. But it's there's almost really no rhyme or reason that we can discern uh, to the pattern of recaptures. We really still just aren't completely sure what's going on. It's going to take some pretty skillful um, high-end analysis to, fig to try to discern some of these patterns. We've learned that we capture more birds on clear nights that are calm or with a light wind out of the Northwest. And what that corresponds to is nights after the passage of a cold front. When these birds have a nice tailwind, smooth conditions, and they can really uh, make some headway on their way south. We also find that we catch more birds during the darker phases of the lunar cycle. And we think that has to do with visibility of the nets. We actually, one year, during a bright full moon, we had spectacular conditions for migration. Tundra swans are streaming overhead, but we caught no owls because they could see the nets. That night, there was a lunar eclipse. And during that period of time, during the peak of the lunar eclipse, we caught 25 birds. So it's, we think it all has all to do with the visibility of the, the nets. Most of the birds that we catch are female. We, we believe that there's differential, uh, there's a sexual difference in terms of migration, that more females come south, more males stay north on territory. Um, they're smaller, maybe they can be better supported by what they catch, and maybe they're staying to defend um, nesting cavities. And here's a very interesting thing, and I've already alluded to this, that when we had a year with a greater number of captures, the greater, uh, the majority of those birds are young birds, young, young of the year. So here's a little table that hopefully will make some sense to you. So this uh, green dots, this line right here is the total number of birds that we catch. And the red dots correspond to the percentage of the total that are adults. Notice in the big peak years of captures, far fewer of our birds are adults. Okay, so if we plotted instead all the hatchier birds, the two, the two lines would correspond very well. So big years of captures, excuse me, big years of captures, far fewer adults, okay, is how that works. So obviously these guys don't just show up occasionally in the winter. They are moving through here in surprising numbers. We had a night when we caught two different nights in 90, uh, 99 that we caught 59 birds. There are other stations down on the Delmarva that have caught something like 130 at night. And I think the one at Foreman's Branch more recently caught, uh, which is near Chestertown, caught way, way, way over 100 birds just a few years ago. So they're definitely moving through. But these, these are northern birds, right? You go north, it's colder, okay? So let's, so why aren't they further south? Well, here's what we think, okay? Let's do some basic uh, geometry. 
I want you to think of a big bird on the right going down to a little bird. Now, birds aren't shaped like cubes, but this allows us to do math well. So as you go from bigger birds down to little birds, there's an interesting relationship that happens. If we compare surface area of a bird, which is the surface across which heat will be lost, relative to the volume of the bird, so all of those cells in the interior that all are undergoing metabolism, which generates heat, okay? The re relationship of surface area to volume changes from being big to little. When you are big, you have a lot of volume relative to the surface area. And if you are a bird, you are warm-blooded, okay? Kind of like foreigner hot-blooded, only different, but you're warm-blooded. But what that really means is you maintain a constant body temperature regardless of the environment, environmental temperature. You're a homeotherm. And how birds and mammals do that, now they take advantage of the sun and they take advantage of insulation, but much of their heat um, uh, much of their heat regulation is accomplished by capturing the heat generated by metabolism. That's easier when you're bigger, but as you get smaller, you have more and more surface area relative to, the, to your volume. So look here, as you get smaller and smaller, the relationship of surface area to volume gets bigger and bigger. That means you have far more surface area across which to lose heat relative to the volume from which you generate heat. And that's a problem. So there's a lower limit for birds and mammals in terms of being small. Because, um, what, so what are you gonna do? Well, you're gonna have a higher metabolic rate and in the case of sawwet owls, you're gonna have a tremendous amount of insulation. Sawwet owl, the actual size of the body is way smaller than what you would think from the feathers. Sawwet owls, and it's hard to tell this, sawwet owls can get their head through a hole this big in mist net. They are, they're small, they're tiny. So they are heavily insulated and that's their adaptation for living in the North where it's cold. High metabolic rate, heavy amount of insulation. So they produce a lot of heat and insulation helps retain that heat. There was a guy named David Ligon, I assume is how it's pronounced, that published this paper in the 60s. And he did a type of research that is not the least bit interesting, or I would never want to do it, but he was a physiologist. And he looked at how different owls um, fared when temperatures were cranked up. And as you read this paper, you will see that the two owls that he had were heated to roughly 110 degrees. And each of those birds were stressed and eventually died. These guys are not adapted to high temperatures. They're built to be able to handle cold temperatures. And when they're exposed to hot temperatures, they don't do well. So you would think here in Maryland, we shouldn't have saw wet owls, right? Because we're further south right? And it gets warmer as you go further south. Now, but then there's this little thing going on right here. So what is the deal? So let's do a little geography. Here is Maryland. And most of y'all, I suspect, are somewhere down in this area. I'm out here. You can see me waving to you guys from up here, right? This is Garrett County. You know, Western Maryland is a different beast. We're closer to Pittsburgh than we are to you guys. We get Pittsburgh media. We love ravens. In fact, we have a lot of them I, every day. We get to hear ravens and it's cool, but we don't really care for the ravens up here. I'm just sorry to tell you this. We like the Steelers. We love Orioles, but we're not as big a fan of or the Orioles as we are the Pirates. Frankly, it doesn't pay to be a fan of either team right now. We're not fans of the Capitals. I'm sorry to tell you that. We like the Pens. Hey, Terrapins are cool, right? But up here, we tend to be more connected with WVU. Let's go Mountaineers. And although crab cakes are delightful, 
we really like those West Virginia pepperoni rolls. In fact, the majority of Garrett County isn't even in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, and there are a lot of folks that don't realize that. So we're different, and we're different topographically and climatologically, okay? We out here are part of the Allegheny Plateau or the Allegheny Mountain Province. These are, this is the most mountainous region. You guys know if you come west, the mountains get, you, you encounter mountains. And as you go from Cumberland up to Frostburg, up into Garrett County, you climb in elevation. And in fact, in Garrett County, most of us are at least 2,000 feet in elevation, whereas you all are down much closer to, to sea level, okay? And as you go up in elevation, it's like going further north, right? And temperatures decrease. So if we look at temperatures across the state of Maryland, we are at, we are literally and figuratively the coolest part of the state, okay? Every time it's, you know, you guys are sweltering here, it's not quite so bad, or sweltering down your way, it's not so bad up here. Okay. In fact, um, the, the start of next week, we have forecast to go back down in the 40s at night, which is just great if you ask me. So we're cooler. Our high elevation does something else. Our higher elevations, now this is an exaggerated relief map for the state of West Virginia from a book called The Flora of West Virginia. As you, you get high enough, it's like going far enough to get spruce. And you can get spruce at high elevations. You can get northern hardwoods. We're going to talk about that. But these high elevations intercept air masses coming from the west, laden with moisture, and they wring out the moisture on the western slopes of our mountains, which makes Garrett County the west wettest part of the state of Maryland. We have places that receive in excess of 50 inches of precipitation annually. Okay. And that translates in the winter to snow. We get a lot of snow. Um, in the winter of 2009, 2010, we got nearly 260 inches of snow. It was, it was amazing. So we are very different in terms of our climate where it's like being further north. If you look at this, it's a lousy map, forgive me, but this is one that I could find that shows different vegetation types. And this is what's called the Northern Hardwood Forest, which predominates in parts of New England, upstate New York and the Great Lakes states, but it fingers down at higher elevations into the central and even the Southern Appalachians. And if you get up high enough, you even have spruce, okay? And if you read the description of, and I got a squint here, so just don't look at me staring into the screen. It says birch, that's yellow birch, beech, sugar maple, eastern hemlock. So let's remember that. When you look at the typical habitats that are used by northern solid owls across their range, they tend to occur in conifers or mixed deciduous coniferous forest conifers. And we're not talking about loblolly pines, the southern pines. We're talking about northern conifers, spruces, firs, northern pines, etc. Okay. Now remember, and that would include hemlock, eastern hemlock. Here's the range of eastern hemlock in the central and southern Appalachians. You can see it's primarily in the western part of this region at the higher elevations. You may know eastern hemlock in the distance with these tips of the twigs all riding with the wind, kind of flopping over these flat needles that are whitened on the underside, right? And the spruce that was referred to in that slide, when you get to the Appalachians, it's red spruce that occurs in just these little islands down the spine of the Appalachians, including here in Western Maryland. Red spruce is a more Christmas tree looking tree with spiky kind of pointy foliage that is not so fun to get in, okay? And the interesting thing is is when you look at the distribution of northern Sawat owl breeding records, they tend to, as you go further south, become more and more um, confined to areas where you have red spruce. Now there's an issue of scale with the mapping here that makes this a little less precise, but they become more and more specific to high elevation red spruce. But do we have Sawets in Maryland? 
Do they actually nest in Maryland? That's a question that we have had. So when you look back through the records, there are various records of young sawwet owls, but they were able to fly. Presumably they nested in the area, but you didn't have an actual nest to prove it. Most of these were in far Western Maryland. You've got one in Frederick County that may have been actually associated with Catoctin Mountain. In the first breeding bird atlas in um, Maryland in the eight, 1980s, there were two records of calling sawwet owls from Garrett County and one from Green Ridge State Forest that in retrospect may actually have been a tricky Eastern screech owl. I don't know for sure. And there were some other records in the early 90s of sawwet owls calling in uh, far Western Maryland. And then there's this intriguing example from Cunningham Falls. So Dave and I, Dave Brinker and I got together and developed a study to try to demonstrate whether or not sawwet owls breed in Maryland. And if so, where in Maryland and what were their habitat preferences? Now the Northern sawwet owl, it's an owl. It's not easy to find at any time. And so if we're gonna be able to find it, our best way to find it is by its call, <clears throat> okay? So what we would do is we would go out to areas of suitable habitat based on our sense of where they should occur. And we would broadcast their call into the dark and wait for them to call back. <clears throat> Okay, now I will have to tell you that there is no more wild sound on the face of the earth than, this, than the call of the northern sawwet owl. You could think of wolves howling in Denali and that would be so cool. Or lions roaring at night in the Serengeti Plain and that would just be, you know, amazing. Or loons, you know, in some, the fastness of some boreal lake in Ontario. I can't even do it right now. But anyhow, you go, oh, the loons are back, Walter. Um, yeah, that's really wild. But that pales in comparison to the cry of the northern sawwet owl. And I'm actually able to imitate that sound for you all if you think you can handle it. Now, a lot of people have trouble with this, you know, various like heart issues and, and stuff. So, you know, I, I think Bronwyn said you guys all signed a waiver. So I'm, I'm going to assume that you guys are cool with this. So I'm going to do this call for you now, if you're ready. I want you to picture a dark spruce forest, okay? And here is the call. And you guys are ready, right? Okay. Everybody's ready. Here we go. You're sure you're ready, right? Okay. All right. Here we go. All right. So it sounds like a garbage truck backing up in the distance. But when they get excited, this is what they do. It's just this endless, monotonous tooting that goes on and on and on. And it doesn't sound like much, but I want you to picture this. You're at this, this area of a, a swamp with spruce and hemlock and stuff. And it's April and the sun is setting and, um, and the spring peepers are starting to crank up. And it was in the, actually in the low 60s that day. Now the temperature is sliding into the 50s and the peepers are just going to beat the band. And as the sun sets, a full moon rises in the east. And there's just this little shroud of fog across the depths of that swamp. And as it gets a little cooler and gets down into the upper 40s, the peepers maybe calm down just a little bit. And out there in the middle of the swamp, you hear this It's like this bell out there. And it's a male northern sawwet owl calling. And it is really cool. You forget about garbage trucks. And you just think how cool it is to actually hear one of these guys call. So we went out and played this tape using a Cabela's cassette tape game caller. And guess what? Now, check out this really awesome slide from the 90s. Boom. You, nobody's got, hey, nobody's got anything on us in terms of PowerPoint. 
Here's where we found calling owls back in the 90s. If you know anything about Carrick County, this is Cranesville Swamp. This is the central part of the county, the greater Biddinger metropolitan area that actually hosts a couple of Nature Conservancy mountain peatlands. This is New Germany State Park. And we had owls calling. So we knew they were there, but the question was, were they nesting? Well, where do owls nest? Saw what owls nest in holes, in old woodpecker holes and trees. So we thought we had a great idea. Let's go out to places where we had heard them like Cranesville Swamp and let's go knock on dead trees and, that had holes in them, see if an owl would stick its head out and look at us. Well, guess what? Cranesville Swamp's got a lot of dead trees and we, we accomplished nothing better, more than just look stupid trying to find these nests. So we thought there's gotta be a better way to find these nests. And then we hit upon it. Let's build nest boxes because if we build them, they will come. So that's what we did. Our students built a bunch of nest boxes and then during the depths of winter, we went out and put these nest boxes out in places of suitable habitat. And when I went out the first time to check a nest box, put that ladder up a tree, and when I opened up the box, you know what I saw? Nothing. 30 some nest boxes, a whole lot of nothing. Oh, I had a red squirrel or two run up my arm and that was exciting, but no saw what owls and we were depressed. But then we said, you know what? We're gonna build better boxes and more of them and try again the next year. And so that's what we did. In the following spring, Dave Brinker went out into Cranesville Swamp. Sure, he was about hundred meters from the West Virginia line, but who's keeping track? And he got to a nest box and something poked its head out. This was cool. So we went back a few days later and we checked the box and this is what we call in biology eggs. And this was cool because this was the first documented nest of a northern sawwood owl in Maryland. So we came back a couple weeks later to the eggs, didn't hatch, they were infertile, but these are two young northern sawwood owls first ever found. Now, this is something interesting about this picture. Right here is a part of a swamp sparrow. Here's part of a southern redback vole. I believe nature in this slide is teaching us that it is okay to sleep with your food. Try it tonight, I recommend it. So we took the birds out to measure them and put bands on them. Here's what they look like. Uh, faces only a mother could love, but they look different, don't they? What's up with that? Is the mailman somehow involved with this? No. Owls do things differently than your, your regular everyday neighborhood robin. They sit on an egg as soon as it's laid. And so their eggs, whenever an egg is laid, they start incubating it so their eggs hatch at different times. This bird is older than this bird by maybe a day or two, okay? Now, I am a proud father. These are pictures of the last uh, recorded evidence of when my daughter thought her dad was cool. And, and it's under, hard for her to understand why her dad was, thought he was, it's hard to understand why she thought her dad was cool because look at that really cool haircut. But then there was a lot of years of pretty, you know, rough times, right? But then my daughter thought I was cool again. So, you know, I'm, I'm a proud dad, but I'm also the proud godfather of owls. And I would like, with your permission, to share a brief family album with you. Here's the last of five from a nest box, actually right around the corner from where I live. Here's a group of three here. Here's a group of three that look particularly excited to have been involved in the research project. And a clutch of four. So during those heady days in the 1990s, when I was young and I didn't have a child, we did a whole lot of this and we were able to document northern sawwood owls nesting in several different places in the county. And there have been other nests found since then. One of them, an actual natural cavity nest on the backside of Harrington Manor State Park, which was really, really cool. So they definitely nest here. But remember one of our questions was, what is the habitat they use? 
we have found them in three main types of habitat. We found them in some of our swamps and some of the many of these protected by the Nature Conservancy, where you have a mix of red spruce and eastern hemlock and rhododendron. So for instance, here are a couple of scenes from where we've had them nesting in Cranesville Swamp, which is an absolutely incredibly cool place. Back in the middle of the swamp, you got to fight to an amazing place that has large cranberry, small cranberry, creeping snowberry, and bog copper, state endangered butterfly. Amazing place. Here's another type of area of swamp forest. We've also found them in riparian hemlock. That means hemlock stands along streams, these stream corridors, they're deep, they're shading. You've got a lot of hemlock and you've also got a lot of rhododendron um, or what a lot of people locally call uh, laurel, this stuff right here. And here would be an example of that type of habitat thick with hemlock and rhododendrons. So we found them there. But we've also found them in conifer plantations, specifically places where Norway spruce, which is similar structurally to red spruce where that's been planted. Here's Norway spruce with these, it's a non-native species with these dangling branchlets. And as you drive through Garrett County, especially in the winter, you will see these big areas, especially in state forests of conifer plantations. And we found these guys nesting there. So they do nest here. So let's go back to this image once again. You can see that as you go through the Appalachians from north to south, the range of sawwets becomes, with a couple of oddball records, mostly restricted to the highest elevations and primarily where there is red spruce. In fact, the further south you get into West Virginia, you really don't find them much in Eastern Hemlock anymore. You find them in these high elevation forests of red spruce. And if you get down into the Southern Appalachians, also Fraser fir, that's where you find them. So what's the explanation for that? Well, here's an interesting thing. If you look at the distribution of red spruce from north to south in the Appalachians, and you look at the lowest elevation at which it occurs, as you go south in general, you have to go higher up to find red spruce. And you might wonder what, what the deal is with that. Well, researchers have looked at this and they've looked at the average annual temperature at these sites. They've looked at the average temperature in January and the average temperature in July. And what is interesting is what the, the most consistent is summer temperature. Uh, red spruce at the highest temperature, average temperature was in New York at a site in New York. Average temperature in July, 67 degrees Fahrenheit, if you will. Red spruce is limited in, in terms of temperature, primarily because that, that relates to moisture loss and it's prone to evaporation. And if it's too dry, it's not gonna make it. And so it's already in moist locations in the Appalachians, but it can't handle higher temperatures because that causes uh, stress in terms of moisture loss, we believe. So here is a map of the central and southern Appalachians, and this isn't average annual or average July temperature, but it shows the number of days per year where temperatures get especially warm. You know, in Garrett County, 90 degrees doesn't happen very often. 80s is just yucky up here. So we're just not that used to it. And neither is red spruce, right? Red spruce needs cooler temperatures. Now, plot that against red spruce. You see what we have here. And then add saw wets to the mix. So what we have found here in Garrett County is we do indeed have northern saw wet owls here. And it's part of this Appalachian population that goes down the ridges of the Appalachians at higher and higher elevations as you go further south, more and more specifically associated with red spruce. Now here is a grim figure. If you look at the original estimated um, coverage of red spruce, um, in West Virginia, Central Appalachians, and then if you add the Southern Appalachians like the Smokies and stuff, 
it has decreased dramatically. Red spruce was a species targeted during the original boom of logging around the, er, around the turn of the 1800s, 1900s. And in general, roughly only 10% of the original coverage of red spruce still supports red spruce. For instance, here's a figure that Dave Brinker came up with. The red is the original distribution and the green is current. Now, um, the Nature Conservancy and the Monongahela National Forest are doing a lot of things to try to restore red spruce, but they've got a long ways to go. And there are a lot of species that are dependent upon this ecosystem. The, uh, the, the Virginia subspecies of the Northern Flying Squirrel, the Cheat Mountain Salamander, variety of birds and Northern Sawwood Owls. And here's a fact of island biogeography. When you take larger chunks of habitat and you chop it into smaller chunks, each of those chunks can support, can't support as big a population. Populations are now smaller. Smaller populations are more vulnerable to extinction. And to replenish them, you've got to have birds from adjacent areas come in. But now these areas are more separated from one another and it becomes more and more difficult to sustain populations in these smaller chunks of habitat. And so um, red spruce and all the species, including sawwet owls, are you know facing some challenges in the Appalachians, including here in Garrett County. There are a lot of things that are threatening their habitat. Logging, maybe not so much because there is not as much of it in the spruce zone. There's certainly some development going on in some places, but that's not a major issue. Acid deposition is less of an issue than it used to be. For firs, the balsam woolly adelgid is an issue, but in our region, hemlock woolly adelgid, you guys may be familiar with this. This is a non-native, uh, uh, aphid-like insect that, uh, that really stresses hemlocks. And you can see evidence of these guys here. Um, when you don't have harsh, cold winters, these guys really get a jump and they are really beginning to pop back up in force up here in Garrett County again. Look at this sad image from the Smokies of mortality of Eastern hemlock. It's just heartbreaking. Obviously, the loss of hemlock is going to present challenges for a variety of species, including northern solid owls. And of course, the biggest concern of all is the specter of climate change. We've, we've mentioned that spruce is affected by temperature. Higher temperatures would lead to loss of spruce. Higher temperatures would lead to loss of sawwets in the Appalachians. Here is a figure estimating the decrease of red spruce in West Virginia from um, earlier this century through to the later um, part of this century if trends continue in terms of temperature increase. It's pretty sobering. What, how solid owls will fare further north may be better, but for us here in Garrett County, which is like West Virginia, only less so, we're almost, almost heaven. Um, you know, that's cause for concern for us. For the time being, we still have them. You can still hear them. You have to work to do it, but there are places that you can go. So that's a little bit about Northern Sawwet Owls. Northern Sawwet Owls are not just these rare birds that somebody occasionally finds in the winter. They're actually migrants in our area. Um, wintering, particularly at lower elevations, um, where they can find good cover and find good prey supplies. And they actually breed here in far western Maryland. So they are out of sight, but they may be more common than you think. And um, it's pretty neat because these guys bring joy to a lot of people. So thank you for your time. I think, Bron, when I went a little long, I apologize but I hope that you guys uh, found that informative and interesting. I'm gonna go ahead and stop my share. Thank you, Kevin. That was wonderful. Um, uh, that, was, that was great. And I know that everybody has added um, the saw wet to their, their, their list that they want to uh, go and find and see. Um, 
Uh, but we I might want to mention something as you say that, Bronwyn, and this is true of all owls. People are always so excited to find these guys. If you happen across one, please don't post it on Facebook. Um, don't do stuff that will get, I mean, it's cool. We want people to see these, but these guys are prone to disturbance. Owls are, so keep your distance, appreciate it, get a picture back out, and don't share it with the whole world. It may seem selfish, but it's really the welfare of the bird that we're most concerned about. Sorry to interrupt. No, thank you, Kevin, for that. That's uh, very important and always something that we need to consider. Um, we have a couple of questions mm -hmm. that were that were given in during the talk, and I know that folks may have some more questions that they want to pose to you now, which is great. You can just raise your hand, and I can call on you. You can unmute and um, ask Kevin. But um, in, uh, just one second, let me get the ones in the chat. We had a couple of people asking about the cicadas and saltwet. Because we're all about the cicadas. Is there any correlation between population and saltwet? Well, guess what? And do they eat them? We are not hearing. We don't have cicadas up here. You have to drop down. Even just to prosper, you start getting more. We, it's you get to into the Savage River drainage in some places in eastern part of the county in the North Branch drainage, but for most of the county, we don't have we don't have these cicadas. So I have to go to Cumberland to hear them. So the likelihood that you're going to have saw webs where you have cicadas is less. Where you guys are, everybody's eating them, right? It's just this smorgasbord that happens every 17 years, but but not for us. That's a great question. And I do think they would eat them, but um, you know, but but I don't think they I don't think there's inter, any intersection between the breeding range of sawwets, at least here in cicadas. All right. Bruce had a question. Um, at CERC, we capture very few banded sawwets. When will telemetry become more commonly used? And do we have percentage numbers on total capture to numbers of banded sawwet capture? Okay, so there are two parts to that. Let's talk about recoveries. Okay, so in you know, in, in bird banding, we're, we're putting these bands on these birds so that maybe somebody will catch them again and then we can connect dots, right? And we can also learn about survival and a variety of other things. Now, um, that works great for waterfowl because we have a really good way of recovering waterfowl because we hunt them, right? And, um, and so that waterfowl, those are the birds who get great recoveries. Um, before the advent of the audio lure, finding a banded owl was like a needle in a haystack. But when people started using this audio lure, did two things. It cranked up the likelihood that you would catch birds. And it made more people get involved because they were going to have some success. We now have more stations. And I, and I don't have the figures, but I think, you know, uh, Sawwet owl banders are the envy of most other bird banders because we get far more recoveries than most folks do. Now, I don't, I couldn't tell you the percent, and um, I'd have to ask Dave Brinker about that. Um, but um, it's gone up over time, and um, yeah, I mean, every year we catch. I, I forget how many we had this past year. Out of ninety-three birds, three or five of them were banded. That's not bad. If you're if you're capturing, uh, you know, uh, yellow warblers, that just doesn't happen. The second question is telemetry. Well, there, you know, telemetry, and it's unbelievable what we can do now with uh, geolocators and nanotags and the MODIS network. It's a it's unbelievable what we can do now. And people have done some work with sawwets. There's a guy named Scott Widensall up in Pennsylvania, or he was in Pennsylvania, he's just recently moved, that, that he and the folks that work with him have done some things. Um, and I think there's there's more to be done. I strongly encourage you, by the way, to, to get the book, um, uh, oh golly, A World on the Wing. I think it is Scott Widensall's brand new book on migration. It's amazing and very sobering all at the same time. He wrote a book about 20 years ago called Living on the Wind, Pulitzer Prize winning book on migration. This book is phenomenal. Um, but it's amazing that what we can learn about birds now that we couldn't learn a generation ago. So I, yeah, more, more will be revealed to answer your question. 
There's a lot you can do with telemetry and solid owls now that you couldn't do 20 years ago. Uh, Bruce was also interested in the, the coloration of the birds. Um, do, do they, are they darker when they're juveniles? Am I getting yes. that right, Bruce? Yes, you know, I showed you that, um, that slide. Um, let me show you this, this, bear with me. This is like watching your life go in front of your, pass in front of your eyes backwards, right? Oh, there we go. Young sawwets are really cool looking. That, and, and, but this doesn't, by the time you get to the fall, they don't show this plumage. This is what they look like as nestlings and fledglings. They're this dark brown and this rich kind of ochre here with this really prominent blaze, right? But by the time we get to capturing them in the fall, they don't look like that anymore. Now, as adults, there is some variation in, in darkness, primarily the populations on the Queen Charlotte Islands. I think they've renamed those using a, an Aboriginal name now, but off the coast of Canada, those birds are distinctly darker, which is true for a lot of Pacific Northwest uh, species. But otherwise, there's not much variation other than from juvenile to adult. That's it from the chat. Does anybody have a question they would like to pose to Kevin? Yeah, I would just ask one more if I could, thanks. Sure. Um, because the lure is a male mating call, we tend to get huge percentage of females, uh, you know, compared to ma males. And um, so I've always been curious as to whether there is any evidence regarding the number of males that are heading south uh, because obviously we're not going to be capturing a representative sample of that migration. So the, 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 the story is that this ratio was fairly similar prior to using the audio lure. Okay, because it does, you, you kind of wonder why would birds be attracted to this? Although think about it, if you're a robin and you hear another, if you're a male robin, you hear a robin singing, you're gonna go there, right? Because that's a competitor for chicks, right? Okay, um, and if you're a female, you might be attracted to it. So it's not necessarily, I, I would argue that males might be attracted to that call as well. But before we were using the audio lure, we had a, a relatively similar ratio, apparently. And so um, there, there, there are a couple, of, there's some really interesting things that we're not completely sure about sawwets. We don't know whether females even return from to the same place from one year to the next to nest. They may be somewhat nomadic as breeders, which is kind of weird for birds. There's a related um, bird called Tengmalm's owl, which may be a subspecies, the boreal owl in uh, like Scandinavia, that there's evidence for it in that species as well. Um, so, you know, I, so I guess what I'm saying is I think that ratio still e exists, even without the attractant of the, of the call. Well, Kevin, it seems to me that there is going to be so much learned in such a short period of time when we get into telemetry. Oh, I, I absolutely, I agree. And it, it, what amazes to me, me is amazing to me. I heard a presentation 25 years ago, um, somebody saying that this was the most poorly under, maybe the most poorly understood owl in North America, which, and now you think, how could that possibly be? But we, you know, this always happens, right? We have more questions than we have answers at this point. And um, I think, you know, telemetry is going to be one way. If you can get transmitters on birds where they're nesting, especially, right, and then can monitor their movements, that's when you're going to learn the most because that's what you really want to find out what's going on because you can follow them from where they nested and see where they go. And you can also get a better handle. But I think if you look at the literature, sex ratio from studied populations is still roughly 50-50, as it is with most species, at least in the nest. Yeah, it's amazing. Kevin, are y'all, when you could capture the birds, are you taking any um, blood or DNA? There are people that do that. And we have done that in the past. Um, 
Um, but we haven't done that in recent years. But there are people that are that are doing that. People would take feather samples because they could do isotope analysis and get some sense of the origin of that bird when the feather was produced. There are all sorts of things that people have done. And there was a graduate student at Appalachian State a number of years ago that did some genetic analysis of the birds that were nesting in the southern Appalachians. So there are people that do that, but you know we don't. And the thing about our operation is we most stations it's just one or a few people that do it right and you know those people are amazing because i don't know how they do some people have jobs and do this but that's hard to sustain so we we um trade a bit of data um even potentially consistency and 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 depth of what we can collect can collect uh for for coverage and we run from dusk till dawn every night that we can. Now, last year, because of the pandemic, I actually had one kid there all the time. He thought that was a great idea when he started. He didn't think it was such a great idea when it ended. But we had the luxury of that that year. He didn't have a job. Um, he was in one of these pictures, a, a, a tall freak of a kid named Kyle Klotz. And um, he did a great job for me. But um, you know, we were able to pay him a pittance to do that. That's, that's a tough gig. Um, but so we know that there's some variation in data. There's some things that we know that we can't reasonably collect given, given our model. But it, I'll tell you, it's been a phenomenal opportunity for students to get experience. And some of them have gone on to do things specifically because of their experience with, the, with, the, with this project, which is, which is, you know, for me, the biggest reason I do it is, is, is education, honestly. And we um, appreciate that and we're all better for it and we're all smarter because of it. Um, anybody have some uh, another question for Kevin? Folks have dropped my off, question, I can't imagine why. Okay. My, my, my question is, uh, will you come back and teach us more about West Virginia? About West Virginia? <laughs> I mean, Western Maryland, sorry, well, Western Maryland. I, I, I could, I'm sure I could teach about West Virginia as well because I just got hot off the presses, the second breeding bird atlas of West Virginia. So yes, no, I would be happy to. I'm so glad I finally got connected with this group and I will, I would love to do more if you all would like me to for sure. And I would love to have host folks out our way and show you just how cool um, far Western Maryland is. Yep, we're going to keep working with you um, and get some folks out cool. there. And uh, I can't wait to do some more exploring. Um, and I echo everybody, thank you so much for sharing your time and talents with us. Um, we're all, like I said, uh, smarter report and we're going to take our knowledge that you've given us and share it with other people to make them even smarter. So everybody stay safe, stay curious, stay outside um, and we'll see you again hopefully on a, a Thursday or a Wednesday or even at the Natural History Society for our upcoming program in 3D. So stay tuned. We'll see y'all soon. Take care. Thank you all. Bye-bye.